Hey there, interwebs, and welcome back to Russell's Guide to Monsters. In this episode, we'll be examining living statues and rock monsters, and if you can get through the whole thing without getting the B-52s stuck in your head, a Blade Runner will be dispatched to deal with you because you're clearly not human. The idea for this video came about when I was doing some work on my comedic fantasy novel and homebrewing for the D&D campaign I run, and I realized that if you came upon a humanoid form made of stone in a generic fantasy setting, there are half a dozen different things it could be. If you see something like this in real life, it's just a statue. But in a fantasy realm, it could be a living statue, a basilisk victim, a troll, a golem, a gargoyle, an earth elemental, or any one of a multitude of other things. There are so many rocky humanoid entities that when I tried to make a list of just the better known ones, I found myself creating entire categories just to keep track of them all. Ultimately, I ended up making this diagram with animate and inanimate along the x-axis and living and non-living along the y-axis. The difference between living and animate is the difference between creature and creation, or construct as the latter is known in D&D. You see, things which are merely animate can move around under their own volition, but aren't exactly living, per se. A modern example of something which is animate but non-living is a robot. It moves around and does stuff, but it doesn't metabolize, grow, or reproduce. I also had to add a specific subcategory to inanimate non-living for formerly living. This is mostly reserved for victims of petrification by all manner of magical curses and monsters. I didn't create the subcategory animate formerly living because you basically never see that in fiction, or at least I haven't. Petrification victims are usually treated as little more than stony corpses, so the only way you'd get one that's animated is if it were used as raw material for creating a different entity elsewhere on this chart. Say, for example, a wizard cast animate object to make a living statue, or someone constructed a stone golem out of a petrified corpse the way others might create a Frankenstein flesh golem out of squishier bodies. The one exception I know of to this is the field of maidens and Pathfinder. These living statues are actually the ghosts of female invaders possessing their own petrified remains. Before we get too lost in the weeds, however, let's take a look at some of the better known examples and figure out where each one belongs. First up, we have mundane statues, just like we encounter in real life. These are obviously inanimate, non-living, but counterintuitively, the entities commonly referred to as living statues aren't actually living either. They're merely animate. Remember, the qualifications for life include metabolizing, growing, and reproducing, and living statues are never seen doing any of those things. Sure, there are probably exceptions which vary by setting, but generally so-called living statues are simply magical automata, constructs carrying out their creator's will. On that note, there are two common types of entity which I consider to be closely related to living statues, but which are still distinctive enough to deserve special mention now. The first is golems. These are creations of Jewish mythology, and the original belief was that those who are sufficiently holy, like rabbis, can perform imperfect imitations of miracles. Just as God made Adam out of clay, so too can holy men create imperfect imitations of men which lack souls. Clay is the traditional building material for golems, but other substances like iron, amethyst, and even snow aren't unheard of. For the purposes of this video, I'm talking about stone golems specifically, but what I'm about to say applies to all golems in general. Like so-called living statues, they qualify as animate, non-living, since they don't grow, age, or metabolize, and they specifically lack a soul. One of the few exceptions to this is the Pokémon named Golem, which is an animate living creature. Your standard golems, however, are even more like robots than most other generic living statues. They're activated by placing a shem, a piece of paper with magic words on it, into the mouth or forehead, which isn't all that fundamentally different from a hard drive with an operating system on it. Depending on the setting, a golem might instead be activated by writing the Hebrew word for truth, emet, on its forehead, and one can be deactivated by erasing the first letter, turning it into met, the Hebrew word for dead. I joke that in the world of D&D, if a substance exists in sufficient quantities, someone has made a golem out of it. Standard fare includes clay golems, stone golems, and flesh golems a la Frankenstein's monster, but there are also adamantine golems, brain golems, and rope golems made from nooses. Ironically, the thing which they offer that's closest to a traditional golem isn't referred to as such. It's called an eidolon, which just means idol or spirit, but that's appropriate since it's a stone effigy inhabited by devout souls. Similar to classic golems, but unlike D&D golems, these constructs have holy runes carved into them and are animated by divine magic rather than arcane magic. There are also the caryatid columns, which are mere statues in real life but animate entities in D&D. In the Greyhawk setting, they were categorized as living statues, but three years later the monstrous manual made them a subset of golems, so take your pick. Golems obey their creator's commands, but be careful. Much like robots and computers, they do what you say, but not necessarily what you mean. Also like robots, most works of fiction which focus on them usually have the traditional Luddite message warning that technology is dangerously unpredictable, and that when you create a machine to do the work of a man, you take something away from the man. Goddamn Star Trek Insurrection bullshit. So yeah, golems are essentially the fantasy equivalent of robots, and they usually have some aspect of holiness to them. Speaking of, that brings us to the other so-called living statue relative, gargoyles. 
or would that be grotesques? We've been over this before, so I'll just give a quick recap now. Most things that people call gargoyles are actually grotesques, which are just decorative architectural elements. True gargoyles act as gutters to channel rainwater away from buildings to prevent erosion, and it pours out of their mouths like they're gargling, hence the name. That being said, I've never seen a fantasy gargoyle creature referred to as a grotesque, but you also almost never see them diverting rainwater. I say almost because the gargoyles of Sir Terry Pratchett's Discworld do actually retain their function as downspouts. That notable exception aside, I think it's best just to say that grotesques are inanimate, non-living statues, like you find in real life, and gargoyle can refer to either a fancy kind of downspout or a fantasy creature which resembles a real-life grotesque, but the three are distinct entities. Like golems, these guys also hang around churches, but they generally prefer the roof to the basement. Unlike golems, which are animate, non-living, gargoyles are animate, living. Possibly. It varies depending on the setting, but it's a common theme that gargoyles are nocturnal and turn to stone in the daylight hours. This means that they alternate between animate, living, and inanimate, non-living, or at least inanimate. It also makes them the closest thing we've got to actual living statues, since they are living creatures and they moonlight, or rather sunlight, as statues. Whether or not they're still alive as statuary varies, but one of the original purposes of grotesques was to scare off malevolent spirits. You see, despite their mean and nasty appearance, gargoyles and grotesques have traditionally been considered benevolent protector entities in an early example of dark is not evil. Meeting their gaze, however, is dangerous, but that last aspect is usually omitted from modern works. Nevertheless, the idea that they protect against evil, even as statues, would seem to indicate that they're still alive in that form, just inanimate. When they are animate, the level of stoniness varies between settings, and can be anywhere from living stone statue all the way down to squishy and fleshy. When the latter is the case, it's not uncommon for them to be able to heal any damage sustained when they turn back into stone. Destroying their stone forms, however, is usually a death blow. Another type of creature known to go all stony in the sunlight is the trolls. Well, sometimes they turn to stone in sunlight, but it depends on the setting. The problem with talking about their characteristics is that they're probably the standard fantasy race which is the most poorly defined, and therefore the most varied. They're also sometimes called ogres or giants, again, depending on setting, which doesn't help with the confusion. Gargoyles can be made from stone, as tough as stone, or just very thick-skinned, and possibly possess some sort of healing factor. The same goes for trolls. One of the major differences between the two groups is that while both turn to stone in the sunlight, only the gargoyles tend to recover. The other big difference is that gargoyles tend to be gruff but good, and trolls tend to be evil, or at least antagonistic. The two races are so similar, in fact, that in my urban fantasy universe they started out as one and the same. <clears throat> The gargoyles' origins are shrouded in myth, but legend has it that they were once trolls. When the monstrous creatures marched against the gods' chosen people, some turned on their own kind. The gods rewarded these moral paragons with wings to fly like angels, and although the sun still turns them to stone, they return to flesh once more with its setting. I'm not alone here, either. In Discworld, it's uncertain where the gargoyles' origins lie, but one theory is that they're a form of urban troll. Trolls aren't the only fantasy creatures who can get stoned to death, lame pun obviously intended. There are plenty of ways one might become what I'm going to refer to as a no-longer-living statue. These fall into the category of inanimate non-living and the subcategory formerly living. They're exactly like regular inanimate non-living statues, with the only difference being that unlike normal statues, they used to be alive. Petrified people are usually the victims of a basilisk, or a cockatrice, or a medusa, or a gorgon, or other gorgon, or cataplepis. Look, petrification's a pretty standard, non-standard death in fantasy realms, okay? Some of the creatures I just named may overlap, depending on the setting, but they can all kill you in a variety of nasty ways, and these include petrification. Take, for example, Medusa, which may or may not be distinct from a gorgon. In the oldest stories we have, she was so ugly that just looking at her would kill you, which quickly became death by petrification. Since then, that's changed to meeting her gaze, which itself changed to imply that it's her gaze which is dangerous. Perseus defeated her in myth by attacking her while viewing her reflection in his polished shield, but if you ask me, she should have been defeated by viewing her own reflection in the shield, killed by her own backfiring attack. It's more poetic, and it makes more sense, since a reflection of ugly isn't any less ugly. If you want to know more about Medusa, Gorgons, and the Cataplepis, watch my Guide to Monsters Part 4. The Basilisk and the Cockatrice will get more attention in a coming video, I promise. The other difference between a petrification victim and a mundane statue is that petrification victims might be able to recover, potentially. What I mean is that petrification need not be permanent, but again, it depends on the setting. In D&D, for example, there are a couple of ways to de-stonify someone, including a greater restoration spell or a wish. Of course, that's not to say regular statues can't come to life, too. Even if we ignore the not-actually-alive living statues, you can still find occasional examples of statues magically coming alive, and it's often a direct reference to Pygmalion and Galatea. If you're unfamiliar with that story, don't worry, I got you covered. Pygmalion carved an ivory statue of a woman called Galatea, and she was so beautiful that he fell in love with his own creation, so Aphrodite shipped it and brought her to life. There's actually some discussion as to how big Galatea was meant to be, since ivory doesn't come in human-sized chunks. 
I'm amused by the idea that someone out there read what is essentially a fairy tale about a god bringing a statue to life, but a very large piece of ivory was a bridge too far for them. Yeah, that's the ridiculous part. Willing suspension of disbelief shattered. One interpretation is that Galatea was Chris Elephantine, and another is that ivory was a stand-in word for another white material, like marble, and if that's the case, then there's ample opportunity for a parody song called Rock Me Galatea. Maybe when they said ivory, they meant alicorn. Now, you might say unicorn horns aren't that big either, but you know what? Another rock monster common to the fantasy realms is the Earth Elemental. They generally seem to be living, and they're humanoid masses of earth and stone, but they aren't specifically statues per se. You can often see them described as the living embodiment of the element of Earth, but what exactly is meant by living isn't always clear. Are they alive like a wild animal is alive, or are they living like a living statue is living? Either way, they're definitely animate. If I ever meet one, I'll be sure to ask, mostly because it's the perfect opportunity to say, living stone, I presume? In Dungeons & Dragons, they hail from the elemental plane of Earth, which is predictably chock full of rock monsters. For example, there's the Zorn, which has a rough, rocky hide and eats gemstones, and there's a variant with a more metallic skin called a Zarin, which wants to speak to your manager. Stepping out of the familiar waters of fantasy and into the equally familiar and immediately adjacent waters of science fiction, there are plenty of rock monsters in space, too. TV Tropes calls them silicon-based life, but I'm just going to call them rock aliens. Examples include the Tholians from Star Trek, the Garignac from Galaxy Quest, the Rock Men and Crystals from FTL, and the Anthroliths from my own science fiction novel. It varies between settings whether these creatures are rocky all the way through or just have a tough outer shell, but if the former is the case, then they're more likely to be crystalline than to be plain stone. See, for example, Diamond Head from Ben 10. I'd also like to give special mention to the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who, because they're conceptually related to living statues and function in a way like reverse gorgons. Like Medusa, they're deadly threats, but whereas Medusa is deadly to lay eyes upon, the Weeping Angels become deadly once you take your eyes off of them. For those of you who aren't aware, when you gaze upon Weeping Angels, it turns them to stone, but with gorgons, it's the other way around. Tangent. According to a Hollywood armorer Stephen Fry once met, Clint Eastwood and Yul Brynner were the only two actors he'd ever seen who never blinked when they fired a gun. Now Blondie vs. the Weeping Angels is one of my more bizarre crack pairings, along with Paul Bunyan vs. Johnny Appleseed in The Ents, and Shikamaru and the Vashta Narada vs. the Human Torch. Getting back on track, the Weeping Angels are definitely alive, and whenever we see one, it's in statue form. There's also the Castrians, which are explicitly stated to be silicon-based life. I'd make fun of their crappy costumes, but one of my favorite Star Trek original series episodes is The Devil in the Dark, and people who live in glass houses shouldn't provoke rock monsters. I could go on about this subject of living statues, trolls, rock monsters, and silicon-based life for quite some time and continue to fill in these categories, but like everything else worthy of a video, it's an infinitely deep well. A rock well, in fact, no relation to Norman. Still, this video's gone on long enough, so I'll end things here on that atrocious pun. Artwork used in this video was created by Adrian Alejo, Joseph Fargo, Megan Hetrick, Alexandra Chaudray, Yuki Sato, Jared Krzyzewski, Dan Scott, and Steve Goad. Thanks for watching, and rock on! Getting back on track, the Weeping Angels are definite. Getting back on track, the Weeping Angels are definitely alive. <laughs> Just gonna have toe cracking in the background. It's for your bunkers. Yep. You have loud joints, dear.